So Philippians chapter 3. Let's have a look at the first slide if we can. So it's Philippians chapter 3, it's on page 1180. We'll touch on verses 10 and 11 very shortly, very shortly. But here we go. What's the Christian life like? According to verses 10 and 11, it's really this, that Christianity is Christ-shaped and it is about knowing Jesus, not just in your head, but experientially knowing Jesus the Lord Jesus for yourself, knowing his presence with you by the Holy Spirit. So you'll see it on the screen, it's also in the Bibles in in front of you, the Apostle Paul talking about Christianity being shaped in the pattern of Christ's life, and it's about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, verse 10, I want to know Christ, and the power of He wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. You see how it's a lot about Jesus. It's a lot about Jesus. He's central. Christianity is Christ-shaped. And life, when it's lived rightly, is about knowing Jesus, living for him. We can see in these verses, and I've actually done a a talk, a sermon on this before, where I talked about very much sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And in that, Christianity is cross-shaped. It is the surrendered life, surrendered to the will of God the Father, to what God wants, But also Christianity is resurrection-shaped. It's the resurrection-shaped life. Um, Meaning, well, let's just have a look at these pictures. So we're cross-shaped, resurrection-shaped. And in this this thing about being resurrection-shaped, we are helped, and I know it's not good English, but we are hoped people. We are helped people, and we are hoped people. So we dealt with the cross-shaped, surrendered life in a previous sermon. We're dealing with the resurrected, shaped life of the Christian today. What is it like to follow Jesus today? It is the resurrection-shaped life. Look again at what Jesus says in verse 10. Paul says, sorry, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of, here we go, his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, as in Paul's resurrection and the resurrection of all the Christians with him at that point, around at that point, and ever since, the resurrection from the dead. This is a resurrection-shaped life. If you're a follower of Jesus, and I know many of you are, the way this works, I've already said it, is we are helped and we are hoped. Let's deal with the helped bit first. I can get this right. We are helped. Here is a wonderful truth. Are you ready? It's almost like stand back. Here is a wonderful truth. Whether you feel it or not, here is a wonderful truth. Every Christian on the face of this planet, every Christian receives supernatural help from God to live like Jesus, to know Jesus personally, dare I say it, experientially, in your experience, helped to live like Jesus, here, right here, right now. We're going to see this in verse 10 and elsewhere. The verses before it. That's part of the reason I'm saying have it open in front of you because we're going to be looking at verses before verse 10. 
But right here, right now, some of us as Christians are struggling. Like I talk to you, some of us are struggling. And if you're not struggling at the moment, you probably will be at some stage. There is this struggle that is part of being a Christian. So how is it you're going to keep going as a Christian? How are you going to endure? How are you going to overcome? And for some of you, you've already done that for decades. For others of you, you've got a lot of decades ahead of you. How are you going to keep going? How did Paul keep going with all of his struggles? And we see something of his struggles in verse 10. The sufferings, taking up his cross, like Jesus. Is it a case of DIY? Just do it yourself. You know, you'd be fine. Just, just grit your teeth. Well, thankfully, no, it's not just that. It is that we are helped. Look at what Paul says in verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, that is saying more than one thing. That is talking about more than one period of time, not just the end of time. When Paul speaks of knowing Christ, experience, it is experiencing Christ and the power of his resurrection, he's not just saying, all oh, right, yeah, in the future, you know, tomorrow, one absolutely wonderful day when the dead Christian will know the awesome resurrecting power of God, causing that person to live again in heaven. As Jesus said to the dying thief who turned to him in faith, he said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. That is the experience of many of the Christians we know who have now gone to glory with Jesus in paradise. But this verse is not just that. This part of Philippians is not just about that. This is not just tomorrow when we die kind of verse. It's not, it is that, but it's not just that. This is a today verse because Paul wants to know needed Hey, we need this, needs to know Christ's power today in the struggles he talks about in verse 10, in the suffering of verse 10, and there is suffering in this room, in the suffering of verse 10, he says, I want to know, to experience the power, to know Christ and the power of his resurrection He's talking about knowing, experiencing Christ in the everyday. That same power that raised Christ from the grave. That power of the Holy Spirit helping Paul in his life to live every day for Jesus. As a pastor and theologian says it this way, that Paul yearned for that resurrection power of Christ surging through his soul. Some of you will know Stephen Lawson. As he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now to see this a bit better, let's go back to verse 7 and I'll read from verse 7 to 11. So Philippians 3 from verse 7 says, but whatever, Paul writes, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss For the sake of Christ. All about Jesus. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus, Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And when you read around this, it comes out again and again. It is not just talking about knowing future. It's talking knowing now. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's in all these struggles. He says, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith 
in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship. You know, it's right now, this fellowship of sharing in the, the struggles of Christ, in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's tricky because he's kind of going back, backwards and forwards in his thinking of kind of like now and not yet. It's like, this is, I'm talking about now and I'm talking about future. But he is, he is gunning, he is wanting a closer walk with Christ and to experience, to know the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that flowed through Jesus. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. But what about us? How does that work for us in the everyday? Do we have to go to some special meeting where people are doing some very interesting things and the music's really loud? Uh, do we have to do that? I would say no, we don't. How, how can you, how can I connect more to the power of God in our lives? How can we connect to the Lord Jesus by his Holy Spirit how can we do it? And by the way, when you, when you become a Christian, you get God's Spirit, which also means an intimate connection with the Father and the Son, all three. How do we connect more and more to the power of God in our lives? How do we do it? Okay, in some ways, it's dead basic, it's dead simple, you already know it, but this is what we do. If you're thinking like, how do you live as a Christian? It's kind of like this. We listen to the Lord through these Bibles. We, we listen. We listen to him. And then we trust what he says. We actually, we don't just kind of go, oh, very interesting. We trust and we seek to obey, to follow what this is saying. Follow the Lord Jesus to live like him, to live for him. And we pray. We say, Lord, this seems too difficult for me. It is too difficult for us without the, God's power. And so, with all these kind of simple things, we are helped by his Holy Spirit. Some of you know, yeah, we are helped. The reason you have carried on is because you have been helped by the Holy Spirit. And so we experience Christ in our lives more and more. And sometimes, yes, that is felt experientially that Christ is with you. The Spirit is with you. The Father is with you by the Spirit. And sometimes, this is the way it's felt, is our hearts burn within us. Like those followers on the road to Emmaus. We seem to be reading simple truths and living simple truths. But the Spirit ignites them in our hearts. And Paul wants to know and experience more of this connection, more of this relationship with Christ, more and more. In those verses, do you see, he's just wanting for more. He knows Christ, but he wants to know him better. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And even in that, we can, we're reminded again that being a Christian is always, at the very least, two great things. It is personal. It is so personal. If you want to keep Jesus out here, you ain't got him. It is personal. I want to know Christ. And it is powerful. The power of his resurrection. In a very real sense, the same power, the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ to, from death to everlasting life. The same Spirit who did that is in every Christian in this room. Oh. Be encouraged. I know many of you feel flat right now. You feel flat, some confused. 
But the fact is, the Lord is your mighty helper. Do not be afraid. He is with you by his Spirit. Now just think about, a bit of a sidestep from that, just think about other religions for a second and think about the power that God the Father gives to his people by the Spirit as we receive the Spirit. This does seem to be one of the things that sets Christianity apart from every other religion for we are not called to live godly lives in our own strength. We're not like this pushing a car up a hill, and it's, it's just hard work. We're, we're not like that. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking of trying to push a Rolls Royce up that hill to the little over traffic lights on my own, and all the traffic flying by. <laughs> it's not like that. It's not meant to be like that. Rather, sometimes it can feel like this. Not always. But we have supernatural petrol in the tank. We have heavenly, well, in the modern times, we have heavenly hybrid power, right? Either way, it's the Holy Spirit. We have God's power, resurrection strength power. I mean, going aside from that, the power that speaks and creates everything, this kind of power We praise God for his great help that he gives to his people today. And in some great tomorrow where we're taken into glory, this resurrecting power. God the Holy Spirit empowers the entire life of the Christian. That means many of you. The Holy Spirit empowers your entire life from when you became a Christian. So that is the same Holy Spirit that was in Paul the Apostle. That's the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus of Nazareth when he walked the earth. That is the same Holy Spirit that resurrected, who resurrected Jesus. However, you may feel like this. I don't feel... I don't feel like I have this resurrection power. It's a very nice thing to say. I can see it in the Bible, but I don't feel like I've got it. I don't feel like that's me. Well, you do. It is a fact. Let's just think about, this is in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, which will be on the screen in a second. The way that Paul talks to the worst Christians in the New Testament, or some of the worst Christians who are doing all kinds of terrible things or letting all kinds of terrible things happen. Look at the way Paul speaks to this um, rabble, if you like, messed up church in Corinth. He says, 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know, don't you know, this could be said equally to us today, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Now, it's not always a good idea to point the finger, but I'm going to do it now, because there's a lot of you in yourselves here. Because we forget this. Don't you know, (laughs) don't I know, don't you know that you, yourselves, are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Don't you know, were we forgetting? And of course, when you have the Spirit... That is now an intimate connection with the Lord Jesus and God the Father. And so Paul can say in in 2 Corinthians, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Have you forgotten? Do you not realize? It's hard to get our heads around, but if you're a Christian, you have been born again, you are a new creation, And you have every power you need to live the Christian life for the spirit of God's resurrecting power lives in you. Do you not realize? Don't you know? So we are definitely helped. We're definitely helped by God's spirit. But the Christian life is not just a helped life. It is a hoped life. 
Resurrection also means from these verses that this is a hoped life. It is hope that drives the Christian on. It drove Paul on. It drove Jesus on for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. Now, I've, I've picked the word hoped because I like to think of us as not just hopeful, but marked by hope. Now, I used to go to Blackpool, right, as a kid, granddad's caravan. We went, like, every year to Blackpool. And I just found out my parents are going to Blackpool this year. It's good. It's their first holiday for years. It's kind of hard to get away when, you know, uh, mum's disabled. It's kind of hard to find a place. But they found a place in Blackpool. Anyway, back to my point. Blackpool Rock, or like most rock, it'll like have Blackpool all the way through. So you can break it anywhere and it just says Blackpool, right? Now for the Christian, we are, we don't just hope, we're hoped all the way through. Everything we do ought to be laced by the hope that we have. We are wonderfully driven on, potentially even with smiles on our faces because our hope is so good. I'm not talking about hope like, uh, uh, who I hope might win the Premier League today. Um, just not Liverpool, please. But, yeah, just, sorry, Liverpool fans. Um, so, not that kind of hope, because I don't know. But this is solid confidence in the man Christ Jesus who lived on this earth and died and rose again. Solid hope. How can we keep going despite all the struggles and suffering, and part of the secret is that we are hoped people. Christians stand as witnesses to the hope that they have. We want to be able to give reasons for the hope that we have. Now, there's a lot of people today who think Christians are stupid, right? They'll sort of say, oh, yeah, that's nice for you to believe in that. But they basically think we're stupid. Just to, just to clear this away, we are not interested in stupid hope. I don't care about stupid hope. We want solid hope that deals, can look at death in the eye and say we have solid hope, sure hope, watertight hope. Now, where do you find watertight hope? Well, it's in the watertight person. The life, death, and resurrection of the person of Jesus. And as, as a Christian, each Christian is connected to this solid resurrection hope in the resurrected Lord Jesus. And so Paul can say, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. There's Paul's hope, resurrection from the dead. In all of Paul's struggles, many, if you read about Paul's life in here, he had many, many struggles. Dare I say it, more struggles than you have had. Definitely more struggles than I have had. In all these struggles, what is the fuel that keeps him going through the fire, through the flames of suffering? And it's in verse 10. His resurrection, Christ's resurrection. He rose again. History screams it out. Jesus rose again from death. He really did. What else keeps him going? In verse 11, is Paul's own resurrection, that he would attain to the resurrection from the dead. One day, Paul will rise again. Now, there's a practical thing we can do with that, because you go, well, I don't care. There is a practical thing we can do with this. In your struggles, in my struggles, sometimes just whisper to yourself, Christ's resurrection, my resurrection. Because he did it, he's taken me there. Christ's resurrection, my resurrection. 
He rose, I will rise. Why not say that to yourself a few, at a few moments when you're struggling? Christ's resurrection, my resurrection. He rose, I will rise. Now, there's an objection here that's kind of obvious. Why? Why would any rational person believe in life after death? How could Paul do it? How can we? In a word, Jesus, why believe in life? This is the only reason I do. Why believe in life after death? There is no, there's no perfect argument for life after death. There just isn't. But there is a perfect person who came back from death and turn the world upside down. I don't know if you've noticed, or if you've been traveling around the world, almost anywhere you go, Jesus has turned the world upside down. Check the history books. Resurrected Jesus turned the world upside down. When Jesus himself was at the funeral of a friend, he said these words. I mean, dangerous words to say at a funeral. He said, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me, do you see twice, believes in me. We have to turn our lives over to Jesus or none of this good thing is coming our way. Believes in me will never die. Now, anyone can claim that at a funeral. Say, I am the resurrection and the life. But Jesus put his money where his mouth was very soon after saying these words. At the same funeral, he tells his dead friend, four days dead, to come out of the grave. He says, Lazarus, come out in John 11. And I know this picture is not accurate. This is, there's no historical accuracy on the type of picture that we're about to see. It doesn't tell it like this, but I thought it was fun. It comes out of the grave. I don't know if you can see from where you are. He's like, he's kind of like, whoa. <laughs> um, so it's the, the fashion he came out, not quite like that, but he did come out of his grave. Absolutely wonderful. Because Jesus is the life. He gives life. He is eternal life for us. When Jesus was executed on a cross on a Friday, dead, buried, by the Sunday he's alive again. A real Sunday in history. Incredible Sunday. And Jesus offers life, eternal life, to any who would come to him. It's an open invitation. Anybody can share in this life. Now, do you want it? Or just say in your heart again, Lord, you know I want it. You know I want it. You know I'm walking, living for you. Well, you might ask, what does eternal life look like? What does eternal life look like? I'll tell you what it does not look like. It is not forever floating on a cloud, playing a harp. Now, I've got nothing against harps, right? I'm sure harps are wonderful instruments, and you know some people really enjoy them. But it is not that. There's no biblical basis, any basis for saying we're playing harps on clouds. Here's what eternal life will be like. Solid, real, joyful. I don't know if, think about the last time you walked through a really nice garden, beautiful garden. It's a little bit like that. Hear me out. It's a little bit like being in a garden. I think some of you have been in Elveston Castle recently, just walking around. I can't believe it's free there. You walk around, it's beautiful and it's free. Well, there's something even better that's beautiful and free, and it's what eternal life will be like in Jesus. He paid so we could go. So a really beautiful garden is a little bit like eternal life because it's solid. You know, solid pathways to walk on. It's people walking around on them, smiling, friendly, interesting people. Some of them you know, some of them you're going to get to know. And wonders beyond our wildest imaginings, this is eternal life. 
Because eternal life is solid, real, joyful. The Bible speaks of a great hope that is coming soon. A new heaven and a new earth. Where those who trusted in Jesus in this life will be given amazing new bodies. Terrific. Some of us could do with those right now. Thank you very much. But like amazing new bodies. Went for a jog yesterday. I'm absolutely exhausted today. Still. Ah, we'd love those amazing new bodies right now, some of us. Those amazing new bodies, it's still you. But it's the you that you kind of always hoped you'd be. The new, enhanced, perfected version of you. For the follower of Jesus, when you die, as you close your eyes, for the very last time, you breathe your last breath and then you open your eyes onto eternity in paradise initially with the Lord Jesus what a welcome you receive and so begins the great and glorious adventure eternity in heaven and then on into this perfect new world you will take your place you will take your place. You. Little you. Well, I think sometimes little me. Maybe you think big you, but anyway, little you. You will take your place with the crowds of people, every tribe and tongue and nation, and there's harmony. Will you be there? It's all down to what you do with Jesus. Now, I hope you make it. Jesus is your guarantee that you do make it. He says, follow me. Where did he go? Resurrected to glory. Follow me. Where do we go? Resurrected to glory. Jesus is your guarantee. He says, follow me. For those still holding back on Jesus, still holding back, please. Come to Jesus while you still can. It is the best decision. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And I'm not just talking future, I'm talking now. It is the best decision you'll ever make for this life and the next. What is the Christian life like? We've been thinking about this. It is Christ shaped. It is about knowing Jesus. We are helped and hoped. So it's not DIY, it's with Him and His Spirit. We are helped. If you're a Christian here today, many of you are, if you're a Christian here today, I don't know, I don't know what struggles you're going to face this week because they haven't gone there yet. We haven't gone there yet. But what I do know is the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is in you. He is with you. He walks with you. You do nothing without him being right there. We are helped and we are hoped. What solid hope we have as we turn our eyes and we look to the resurrected Jesus. And in your struggles, in your struggles, why don't you whisper to yourself sometimes? As you struggle, you think, what is going on? How much suffering? In your struggles, say this to yourself, Christ's resurrection my resurrection. He rose. I will rise. We have been connected to his eternal life wonderfully by the Holy Spirit. Your trajectory is set. He says, follow me. And he's gone to glory and you're going to go with him. Praise God, just in closing, praise God that the final word on your life, the final word on your life does not have to be, you know, at your funeral, the final word does not have to be death, darkness, despair, finished. We can say much better words. At the funeral of a Christian, there are so many great words we can say. For those who are following Jesus, we can say resurrection, glory, grace, eternity, rescue, blessing, feasting, 
life, joy, and Jesus. It's so good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness to us. What a thing to to send things to people. But you sent your own dear Son and your Spirit. We've been given far beyond what we would we could ever dare to ask for, and yet you are the generous God. You're the loving God. You're the one who has great plans that will come to pass. So Father, today we thank you so much that you've drawn us up into your wonderful plans and declared many of us here to be your children, children of the living God. Helped and inhabited by the Spirit, your Spirit. Father, when we're struggling, remind us of these things. Remind us that you are our great helper and how close you have drawn to us. We praise you today. Amen.